chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to, his, to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory in the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Carl, I just hope I make it into my 90s, and if I can play in tuba at 90s, thank you. <laughs> That's amazing to me. <laughs> Every day I see him go wherever he goes, and I just thank God. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for life. Lord, we thank you that we are your children, that Jesus calls us brothers and calls us friends, that we belong to the family of God because you loved us enough to give your only son. Lord, that you took your wrath out upon him, that he took our sins upon the cross to ransom us and purchase us back. Help us to realize that our lives are not only blessed, Lord, and set free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, but that we are children of the Most High that, Lord, that we are light to this world and that we should not hide our light or dim it in any way, but shine brightly for, through the power of the Spirit, to walk in step by the Spirit. So, Lord, I pray today you open our, our hearts and minds to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, apply it to our lives so that we'll bring you glory and honor for each breath that we have until we do meet Jesus face to face. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. So I entitled this, you don't see it up there. Last week I gave you Jesus' invitation to you. If you didn't get that, I physically gave you an invitation that said this, follow me, that's the command. That means you have to do te a piso mu, if I said it close enough for you to understand. That means you leave the world behind and you come and follow Jesus. That's what the fishermen did. They didn't understand it. They didn't understand it two years into Jesus' ministry. Here they are. They still lack faith. They still doubt. They still don't understand. They still have spiritual blinders on. They're wondering who will be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus tells them how to do that, and we'll get into that a little bit today. But here we are 2,000 years later, children of the Most High, empowered by the Spirit, sons and daughters of the Most High, and I ask you... What did you do with Jesus' invitation? That's the title of this message. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with it each and every day? When you're given a gift, I think of this because one thing Kim said before, and you put it up on the shelf, what good is that gift that's been given to you? If you've been given the gift of eternal life, of adoption, the child of God of the Most High, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to be given gifts of the Holy Spirit, to have fruits of the Holy Spirit, to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, what are you doing in your life? Is it just on a shelf and you've got yourself fixated because you're living for this world? Or are you truly living as a saint, as a warrior for the kingdom, as a child of the Most High? What will people remember you for when your life is over? Because you don't know how many breaths you have. So last week's question that I left you with, question number seven, I gave you several questions, is what will you do with Jesus' invitation? Personal, what will you do with it? What did you do during those seven days or eight days? The reason I say seven days or eight days, depends on how we calculate that, doesn't it? 
Because if you count the day I gave it to you and you count this day, it's eight days. If you count just a week, it's seven days. The reason I say that is because as we read these next scriptures, you're going to get into a little thing where John and, I mean, Matthew and Mark say six days and Luke says eight days. See how that's really not a problem? <laughs> okay, so let's start with Luke 9 and read this. Verse 23. Then Jesus said to all of them, all of them that were there, the crowd, the Pharisees, whoever was there, the true disciples, he said this claim to all of them, know the cost, know what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. And if you're not a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you haven't accepted his free gift of salvation. If anyone wants to come after me, he must... He must deny himself. He must take up his cross daily, and he must follow after me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. They will forget about all the things in this world and live for Jesus Christ. But whoever loses his life for my sake will be the one that saves it. Yes, I'm adding in a little bit to explain it. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, not just certain things and not become the richest man in the world, but to own the whole world? yet lose or forfeit his very self or his very soul. If anyone is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Because Jesus Christ has promised that he will come again. The Old Testament prophecies point to his coming, which he did come and died for our sins, and his coming again to reign as king and taking his sheep into his fold. So what have you done with his invitation? How are you living his life? Will Jesus be ashamed of you? Or will he say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's my brother or sister. Father, I am proud of them rather than being ashamed of them. Do you understand this as a follower of Jesus Christ? The next verse says, But I tell you truly, some of you who are standing here today will not taste death before they say the kingdom of God. Here's a verse. We'll start out with some controversy and what does it mean? Who knows? <laughs> it's one of those verses. It's, it's not doctrine or anything. We don't know what he's saying right here. It could be the transfiguration which comes up right past this. It could be when Jesus dies on the cross, it could be his resurrection, it could be the ascension, it could be Pentecost, it could be the destruction of Jerusalem. Who knows exactly what it is? What it says to you, the, God, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it divides soul and spirit, whatever that means to you. Are you reading these words? What does it mean to you? Well, I don't know what it means exactly, but are you still breathing? Then you haven't tasted death yet, have you? So then you should be living for the kingdom. It goes back to the words before. You should be denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following after Jesus. Living a life that is not a shame, but living a life that boldly proclaims and lives that you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. If you take it simply, the next verses that Luke writes and the next words that Matthew writes and the next words that Mark writes, we talk about the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. So we'll just take it like a simple child would at this point and just say that Peter and John and James saw that glory. I don't know if anyone else tasted death at that point or not, but Peter, James, and John are still living, and they see Jesus transformed or transfigured before their very eyes. Wow. I don't know if you think about that much or anything, but the, all of this teaching and everything, now Peter, James, and John are seeing Jesus glorified, and they're seeing Moses and Elijah there. Moses, who represents the law, and Elijah, who represents the prophets. Everything they've ever been taught, they see fulfilled in Jesus Christ, who is glorified before them. They know that their faith is... Is real. Peter has proclaimed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And John, he says, Why in the world could we walk away from you, even if the rest of the world did? Though none go with you, still I will follow. You have the words of life. And they see Jesus transformed before their very eyes. And Moses and Elijah talking with him. Everything in God's plan. Not knowing that that plan meant for Jesus to deny himself, to take up his cross, to suffer and die so that we would follow him. Because that's what a disciple does. A disciple gives up his life so that he follows after the master so he can train up other disciples to follow the same way. So I'm asking you, what are you doing with Jesus' invitation to you? 
The cross was the way that Jesus came into his kingdom. Maybe that's what that verse is talking about. And we, we started out reading in Luke chapter 4, the temptation of Jesus, where Satan was trying to take away Jesus' glory by saying, you don't have to go to the cross, bow down to me now, and quoted scripture to Jesus, tempted him. What about the temptation here now in this ne next passage when Peter says, let's build some tabernacles and you stay a while. Jesus came to suffer and die. He humbly gave up heaven to be a baby in the creation that He created, to be raised by human parents. What utter humility to live a life of shame, of poverty, of pointing fingers, of, of constantly trying to take His life before the time was there, and being tempted to take the easy way out and not take the cross. I think about that because I, I want the easy way. I don't want to have... I mean, even if I deny myself, I don't want to have to take up the cross. If I deny myself, I still want it to be easy, Lord. I like the sounds of a prosperity gospel, but they don't follow this. It's the easy way. Scripture tells me that I must deny myself, take up my cross daily, and follow after Him. It is the only way to true life, the only way to come into the kingdom and follow Jesus. So I chose ch challenge us to not wrongly focus on Scripture and not to worry about things like this verse and try to say, what does it mean exactly? I want to be a Berean scholar or study the Word just so I can rightly divide the Word of truth when things like this might just divide us. In fact, we're warned that way in Scripture to not quarrel over the little things, but to know the, the, the meat of Scripture and to grow in that. Are you willing to taste death if that's what the breath of life in you is called for? It's amazing. Jesus says we'll know the words that we're supposed to say when we're taken up before the, the authorities and persecuted and everything. And it's amazing to hear the stories of how people do proclaim because they're fully empowered, like Stephen, at the time that they, their breath is taken away from them to do nothing but proclaim Jesus Christ because it's 100% the Spirit then talking through them, empowering them because they are true children. They don't turn back. They don't shudder at death because it has no sting. Jesus told His disciples clearly that this was the way to enter into the kingdom. So repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So whatever it means that they will not taste death before they see the kingdom, I want you to concentrate on are your eyes fixated on the kingdom? Are you a child? Know that before you do taste death. So I mentioned going in, is it eight days, is it six days? Well, if we read in Matthew and Mark, it says it's six days later. But in Luke, if we continue reading, in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, about, notice there's about also, and there's eight days. Easy fix, because a lot of people say, yep, there's a discrepancy in the Bible, you can't trust it. I just said, was it seven days ago that you got Jesus' invitation or eight? About eight days after Jesus said these things, he took with him Peter, John, and James, and he went up on a mountain to pray. Matthew tells us that it was a high mountain. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. Now what was that mountain? Tradition tells you this. Tradition's probably wrong in this case because it's not a high mountain. But maybe it's not. And don't get me wrong, don't throw stones on me. Mark looked like huh, this. <laughs> not that you are. But where it's celebrated is not necessarily where it is. It might be because it's convenient. It might be a drawing card for, for tourism. It might be a lot of things. If you do some studying, you'll probably think that where it's celebrated is not necessarily where it is. But does it, do we know again? Does it matter? And what did Jesus do? He went up on a mountain to get away from the crowd. Oh, these mountaintop experiences, we like them, but we don't like the valley lows. But yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. But whatever mountain it was, he went to do what? To go with Peter, James, and John to pray. I don't know if Jesus knew he would be glorified there or not, but I know what he went to do. He went to pray to whom? His heavenly Father. 
Because the next thing that's coming up in these writings of Luke's and in the other Gospels is Jesus is going to head for Jerusalem and face all the torture that is awaiting there for him. And he's going to face it with glory and joy going to the cross because of the outcome to save his children, his brothers and sisters. Verse 29, And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. Matthew tells us that it was like the sun, and his clothes became radiantly white. Matthew says as white as light, and Mark says whiter than any kind of soap could ever clean them. So Jesus' face shone like the sun, and his clothes were like light. The one who with a breath of creation created everything and light comes shooting out at, what is it, 493,000 feet per second or whatever it is. I don't know now. I'm telling my years away from studying that. But light travels fast. I'm, I think I am wrong on that. I think I'm close with the 493, but it doesn't matter. Light is fast. <laughs> and when he spoke, he created all things into existence. And his face shone like the sun and his clothes like light. Verse 30, Suddenly then two men, Moses and Elijah, began talking with Jesus. They appeared in glory, they did, and spoke about his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Moses and Elijah. Anytime Moses is talked about, it's talked about the law. Elijah was the key of the prophets that would come before and speak about Jesus. Why wasn't it Enoch? He was just swept away one day. But Enoch would just represent, I don't know. <laughs> but Moses represented the law. What about Father Abraham? But Moses represented the law. Don't you try to live a good life? I mean, I asked Kira the other day how she got to heaven, and she said, being good. <laughs> I mean, it's what we instinctively say. But yet our goodness is like filthy rags. Because we all sin and all fall short of, of God's glorious standard, which is to be perfect. We can't do that. With man it is impossible. With God it is possible because the God-man, Jesus Christ, lived a sinless life and laid down His life to save you. And He did it with joy for what was set before Him. And all of the prophets, if you remember on the road to Emmaus, Jesus opened their eyes and talked about the Old Testament scriptures which pointed, which pointed to Him. All of the prophets spoke about Jesus. Even the, the, the prophets and prophecies that the Israelites excluded and said, this can't be talking about our Messiah because surely He wouldn't suffer and die. When Isaiah 53 clearly portrays a picture of brutality that we could never imagine that our Savior would go through to save us. They appeared with Him in glory. In glory. Not in some unglorified way. They appeared with Him in glory, yet they were recognizable. And they spoke about what? His departure from this earth when His job would be accomplished in Jerusalem, which meant to deny Himself, take up His own cross, and then go into heaven. Meanwhile, Peter, verse 32, and his companions were overcome by sleep. And that seems to be a pattern, as we'll see. They fell asleep in the garden and everything else. But when they awoke, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. So read this carefully. That means this happened, and they were doing what? Sleeping. How many times have you been asleep, spiritually or physically, and missed out on what God was doing? I don't know what all happened before this. Scripture didn't tell, doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us if it was five minutes or five hours. But because they were sleeping, and I know they were tired, it says they were, they missed out on all of these things they could have seen that pertain to the glory of God because they were sleeping. But they caught some of it. Meanwhile, Peter and his companions were overcome by sleep, but when they awoke, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were leaving, <laughs> so it sounds like it wasn't that long. They missed most of the, the good things. I, I don't know. Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. 
Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. Luke adds that in there, and I think it's in the other Gospels. I'm not sure. But to tabernacle with, to come here. But that's temporary because we tabernacle in tents because the glorious future is so much brighter than that. For the Israelites in the deserts who were given manna from heaven, it's a land flowing with milk and honey, cities and gardens and vineyards that you did not build. But yet they've got to fight to get there, don't they? They have to do something. And of course they have to have faith and they have to have obedience and not longingly look back. All the scripture that we see that Jesus tells them applies just like in the wilderness. And what? That generation never saw the promised land. Even the one who got the law from God and had the glory, the Shekinah glory of God glowing off of him, reflecting off of him, not coming through him because he caught the tail end of God's presence, however you want to put it. Why in the world would Peter say, hey, stay here temporarily? But isn't how we look so many times at things? We look at the temporary instead of the, the eternal? And, and we say, oh Lord, if only this could happen rather than looking at the eternal focus? And that's easy to do. We're human beings. We're finite. But we need to realize that we are eternal beings and that we are being transformed ourselves into Jesus Christ every single day as we let the Word of God and the Holy Spirit transform us. Verse 34, While Peter was speaking, a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and they were afraid. The word means terrified. Don't just think it means afraid. They were beyond fear as they entered the cloud. Why? Why? because they were coming into the presence of God. The cloud was with them during the day, guiding them. The cloud covered the mountain, and there was tremblings and thunder and everything else, and the people were sore afraid to go and said, Oh, don't, don't let us come near to the presence of God. And here a cloud appeared and enveloped them. They were coming into the presence of God. And they were afraid, they were terrified, as they entered the cloud. Matthew says they fell to the ground in fear, but Jesus said to them, so you've got to read the other translations to get this, get up and don't be afraid. I don't know why Luke didn't put that. It wasn't part of what he needed to put in his gospel, but, but it means a lot because we have the different gospels to read. Jesus cared enough to conquer their fears, to literally come over and say, get up and do not be afraid. That's your Savior that cares enough for you, that has compassion enough for you, that would say, don't send the crowds away. Instead, you feed them and would expect you to feed them because he had compassion on the crowd. Verse 35, And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my Son whom I have chosen. And Luke says what he says, Listen to me. Not just my Son in whom I'm proud of, well pleased, but we're to the point where listen to to him you have decided to follow after him don't forget that means denying yourself and taking up your cross that's part of what it means to be a disciple never ever look back only look forward don't be fearful or afraid that that means that you'll be set against members of your own household that you'll be persecuted or slandered or anything else because if you're ashamed of Jesus he will be ashamed of you in this adulterous and sinful generation Verse 36, after the voice had spoken, only Jesus was present with them. The disciples kept this to themselves, and in those days they did not tell anyone what they had seen. They were scared to even talk about it. Now, if you read the other Gospels, it does say Jesus warned them not to. And then i got to think about this. Okay, I'm so scared, but i got to tell somebody. <laughs> i got to tell somebody about this, because this is the biggest thing I've ever seen. But yet I've got to be quiet at this point. Matthew says Jesus told them not to tell anyone until the Son of Man had been raised from the dead because He was going to Jerusalem to die but not stay in a tomb. He would rise again and we can celebrate our Lord and Savior that went to a cross and there's an empty tomb that backs it up. And Mark adds they discussed what that meant raising from the dead because they did not understand it at this point. 
even though they had seen <coughs> other people that Jesus rose from the dead, how in the world could anyone raise themselves from the dead except God himself? This is the same sequence of events that you'll find in Matthew and Mark with some slight differences. The first obvious one in Mark 9 begins this way, Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God arrive with power. Okay, now that puts a little more to it. What does he mean with power again? What is power? Well, the power that I read most time in Scripture comes from God. It's the dunamis dynamite power where we get that word, and it comes from the Holy Spirit. Maybe that means Pentecost again. But like I said, don't worry about those things. I told you to worry about, are you still breathing? If you're still breathing, then live according to how Jesus has told you to live, which means deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Him if you want to have life and have life abundantly. And then if you notice... In Mark, that scripture is at the chapter break in with this next sequence. So did those words go with the words previously or did those words go with the words afterwards? Well, again, remember that the original le gospel letters or however you want to call them did not have chapters and chapter breaks. So does it go with the words before? Yes. Does it go with the words after? Yes. <laughs> and the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So you can apply that statement to those things about denying yourself and taking every cross. You can also apply those to that next story of the transfiguration. <clears throat> Either way you read it, you're going to get the same story in the Gospels. The next obvious thing in Matthew and Mark, I've already mentioned too, says that after six days... Don't let that be a contradiction. And study God's Word enough that you can handle contradictions that people bring up. Don't just be, uh, when they ask them. Understand Scripture enough. Be prayerful enough and leaning upon God's Word that's implanted in your heart and the power of the Holy Spirit to answer a question like that. And you don't have to know everything. When you study apologetics, apologetics isn't going to what be, give you what to be said that day that's going to be said. It's, it's the Holy Spirit leading you in that conversation. Jesus gave all power and authority for them to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to proclaim the gospel message. The power and the authority comes from Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit living in you. As you deny yourself, take up your cross, and fall after Jesus, study God's Word and let the Holy Spirit lead you in your life. Period. Your life, as some Christian apologetics say it, is a throwaway life. It has to be because you have to throw the old away to realize the new. The word transformed, transfiguration, is the same thing that we get in metamorphosis, which is a caterpillar to a butterfly. You would never ever dream that a caterpillar would be something like a butterfly because it is so radically different. Who would ever dream that God did that in all of creation? And it's so radically different, and the caterpillar has to literally put himself in a cocoon and eat his, eat his body up, consume it, and die totally so the new creation comes out. Will you die to live for Christ? What will you do with his invitation? <clears throat> after about eight days, after the cost of discipleship, three of Jesus' closest friends, why those three? Well, don't you have personal close friends too? I don't know the answer again. It wasn't because he was grieving these three to be any better or more powerful. You all have equal gifts. Paul tells us that. You're all part of the body of the Christ. And some of the least important, less vi visible uh, components of the body are the most important. Take your spleen out and see. You're all part, so I don't know, James was, was killed prematurely, but that was God's plan again. But they went and saw this. But remember, they went up on a high mountain to pray. And instead of praying, they slept some and missed some. But they did see the glory of God that would let them tell their brothers to be that witness in that life. We saw that, it, and it's recorded later in Scripture as they were eyewitnesses to seeing the glory of Jesus Christ as God. 
I want to emphasize also the pattern there that Jesus was praying and that he was praying with some of his closest friends again. doesn't matter who they were. It's just a matter he brought them into it. So I ask you, are you doing that? Do you have an inner prayer circle that you have? Not just sending it out on a prayer request, but do you, do you share those prayer requests intimately with other people that you know are praying with you and you're doing the same thing? And in person would even be even better in these times of electronics. Luke told us that Jesus was praying in solitude. He went to a quiet place, but he was with his disciples, his closest ones. He taught them how to pray in Luke chapter 6. And he, in uh, Luke 9, 18, he, he was praying alone. Um, and he taught them how to pray in Luke 6, 28, when he tells them to uh, gather themselves together and, and keep on praying. And now Jesus takes the three up on the mountain to pray. So I'm to the point where i got to ask in this scripture, what if we prayed more? What if we realized what was on the mountaintop, what's ahead of us, and weren't asleep so much? What if we prayed more? As Jesus set the pattern up before us and realized that we will be transformed into something we cannot imagine, that the riches that we'll have in the kingdom of heaven will be so much greater. So why in the world would I want to store up riches here? Why would I want to be about, worried about the glory here, let alone worried about what I'm going to eat and what I'm going to wear? I'm, I'm implying teachings of Jesus if you don't understand that. Because where my heart is focused on, the things that I live for, that's what I'm going to live for. Who is the desires of your heart? What is the desires of your heart? Is it Jesus and nothing else? So we've got past the point of just whether you'll be satisfied with the bread of life, but will you constantly want to consume it because it's all that matters to you so that you can tell others? Luke doesn't even use the word transfigured. If you didn't notice that from Scripture, you've got to read Matthew and Mark to get that. And then you'll understand it more when it's used two more times later by Paul, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. It's what's reasonable and prudent. It's the only type of worship you should have. How do you do this? The next verse tells us, Do not be conformed to this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And then he uses it to his letter to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18. And we, with unveiled faces, referring back to Moses, had to put a veil over his face because of the glory. We won't have to because it won't be a reflection. We will be glorified. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. So let your face shine like the sun. Let everything that you do be a light in the darkness of this world because this is a dark, dark world. And it needs your light. And when you put two flames together, they grow in intensity. So we need to be united with one another. It's being changed from something that crawled on the ground... <laughs> and never dreamed it could fly to something that flew away in beauty. And that's the life of a, a child of God, a Christian. What did you, they talk about? Let's emphasize that again. They talked about what Jesus was going to do and accomplish in Jerusalem. Is that what it looks like to the world when they read the next chapters that come up and they read about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and, and the world thinks that Jesus was killed when instead he gave up his life willingly to save his sheep what would you think at that point in, in this gospel message if you being in that time and place would happen to you would you turn away would you say that this is too hard? Many did if we read John chapter 6. Or would you say, no, I will follow you to the end. 
because you have the words of life. My life means nothing. I will live by faith, not by sight. I will trust my family, my children, my friends to you, my grandchildren. I will trust you, Lord. I will fervently pray and give all these things to you, or will I be asleep and miss what's truly important in fixing my eyes upon Jesus Christ and nothing else? Jesus told him on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24, verse 25, O foolish ones, how slow are you to hear are your hearts to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Are you reading the Old Testament also? Because they speak of Jesus. <laughs> Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and then enter into His glory? Why in the world would you think that you're supposed to skip suffering and shame and have a prosperity type gospel versus living a life that denies yourself and facing whatever that cross might be, fought to follow Jesus. Verse 27, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, there we go, Elijah, he explained to them what was written in all the scriptures about himself. The old covenant, the Old Testament, that covenant, that promise much greater than a contract that can't be broken, that requires blood, with it replaced with a new covenant, the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 says, On many past occasions and in many different ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. That's what Mark read from us this morning. Whom He appointed heir of all things, and through Him He made the universe. And what did God say? that Peter and James and John literally heard, this is my son, listen to him. The son, Hebrews 1.3, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature, upholding all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purifications for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And Peter and James and John got to witness that. About six months from this point, they would, rec would, they would witness Jesus' crucifixion and death. And they would be fearfully afraid. Peter would deny him three times. Then they would go to a tomb discovered by women. Not, not meaning anything by that, ladies. But at that point, it meant a lot. And in fact, in the accountability of the Gospels, that was discrediting them to have the women's testimony, which shows even more that this has to be true. They did not find a body, but instead later would experience and encounter a risen Christ. Wow. Is your mind and heart focused on human things or spiritual things? Why would you ever want a temporary tabernacling with Jesus? Why wouldn't you want the kingdom of heaven now? Because Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand and have it for all eternity. Why would you want to light a light and hide it under a bushel? No, <laughs> I'm going to let it shine. Are you going to be fearful when you come into the presence of God? Or are you going to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? Can you imagine coming down off that mountain? I would want to stay. I mean, yes, I would want to go back down to the valley low. In all three Gospels, the next day, the next day, you know, what's going to happen the next day? <laughs> you don't know what Satan's going to attack you with. You don't know what things are going to be like. Are you going to walk by faith? Or are you going to walk by sight? Many times mountaintop experiences are followed by valley lows. If they're not, it doesn't matter. We don't know what each day will be. Each day is a life lived to deny yourself, take up your cross daily. Luke put the daily in there and follow after Jesus. It doesn't change. And that spiritual warfare doesn't change. In all three gospel messages, Jesus comes off the mountain with those three, and the next day he gets 
hurt. I can't imagine how much. Mad, I can't imagine how much. And why? Well, let's read on. In Luke chapter 9, verse 37, the next day when the, they came down from the mountain, Jesus was met by a large crowd. Suddenly a man in the cry, crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit keeps seizing him, and he screams abruptly. It throws him into convulsion so that he foams at the mouth. It keeps mauling him and rarely departs from him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they were unable. Here's Jesus' words. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation. He's already told us to, to deny ourselves, take up our cross. If, if, we, don't wanna, if we want to gain eternal life, to, to lose this life, and if we do do that, we will gain it in this perverse nation, this unbelieving nation. And here it is. He says this to whom? I'm, I believe the disciples also. It doesn't imply anywhere here that he's not saying it to everyone that was there that did not understand that they are to be the church, what we say now, that they are to be disciples, that this man brought his child to them to be healed, expecting this child to be healed because Jesus had already given them power and authority. They should be doing it, but they didn't. As a master, as a teacher, as a rabbi, yes, that would upset me. As the king of all kings and lord of all lords, I cannot imagine how that much that would upset me. Oh, believing and perverse generation, how long must I remain here and put up with you? Now those next words are even harsher in my opinion. How long will God put up with you and your sins and your adultery and choosing other things? And the good thing is He will forever as long as you have that breath in you. But some will pass away before they see Jesus. Will your sins be forgiven and cast as far as the east is from the west? Or will you cry out that day with weeping and gnashing of teeth, Lord, Lord, we knew you. We did mighty things in your name. But he says, depart from me, I did not know you. Do you love the Lord your God with all your soul, all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your body? And do you love your neighbor as yourself? Because you understand what it means to be forgiven, to know the love of God living in you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Even while the boy was approaching, the demon slammed him to the ground into convulsion, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. Matthew and Mark tells us more about faith and more about prayer being a part of this healing. But they didn't understand that still at this point. How sad. It wasn't because the three weren't there leading them. Anything else, the other nine were there, plus the 70, the 120, however many people were there that were disciples at that, this point, plus the crowd was watching, plus this father was begging for this child to be released and expecting it to be done. Matthew 17, verse 20, because you have so little faith is why you could not do it. For truly, I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. move. Nothing will be impossible for you. But yet so many Christians take that and say, I can move a mountain, and they're thinking literally again. <laughs> yet literally you could if you had enough faith, but it's talking about spiritually again. The mountain obstacles in your life. And you've got to remember what Jesus has given us authority to do as Christians. In Mark chapter 9, we read this, The Father asked Jesus, But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and heal us. I've got to add that into the story there. Did they have enough compassion to? Jesus doesn't mention that as a problem, but if you had enough compassion, wouldn't it lead you to praying? Wouldn't it lead you even more to laying on hands and gathering other people to pray if you really had compassion about this boy and the Father? Or do you just lack faith and because it's you don't lack compassion? Is that how you can walk by on the other side of the road? That's what happened in the story of the Good Samaritan. You mean that the, the priest and the Levite had no faith? They had no compassion that drove them to the man. That's what drove the, the Samaritan that we call good, who's a scoundrel, to the other side of the road and do something. Didn't take too much faith in that place. time. It just took a little bit of time and energy and uh, had to have a little inconvenience and cost and time. But I did it because I had compassion. Jesus has answered him, If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. So he's telling the man, If you believe enough, 
my children, my brothers, have the power and the authority to do it. But then they didn't do it. How sad. Immediately the boy's father cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. What the disciples should have been crying out. Jesus answered, this kind cannot come out except with prayer, verse 29. Tells you the element that was missing. So how many times have you not seen a miracle as you were asleep instead of praying? We go back, right back to the mountaintop. Everyone was amazed at what Jesus was doing, the greatness of God, and they worshiped because of what Jesus did physically in His body. Aren't you the body of Christ? Shouldn't they be worshiping God because they saw your light shine before men, the good deeds that you did and glorified your Father in heaven? So if they're not, are we lacking in that area? Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, You are the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they set it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. There we are to the mountaintop high. We had Moses and Elijah there. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And I am departing from this world, and I am leaving you. And I'm not leaving you as orphans. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will come so that you can comfort others because you had compassion and you have power and authority to do something about it. Have you accepted Jesus' invitation to follow Him? Then again, all three Gospels record these next words that we'll read in Luke 9. Let these words sink into your ears. <laughs> Listen up! The Son of Man is about to be delivered in the hands of men. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the King, the Alpha, the Omega, came to this earth to suffer and die for you. Will you follow after Him? Or does your life that you have now mean too much to you that you would profit nothing in this world, no matter what you gain, and lose your soul for all eternity? Or will you Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Jesus. Verse 45, but they did not understand this statement. It was veiled from them so that they could not comprehend it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. Is it veiled, for you, veiled from you? I already read the scripture that said, you with unveiled faces are being transformed. Do I need to read it again? That's what Paul told the church, the church of Corinth, who struggled with the ways of this world. Which one are we going to live for? Are we going to live for the ways of this world and put in different things in the gospel message or are we going to live for Jesus Christ and nothing else? I'll read the verses that we read this morning and close with them from Hebrews again. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, we are in the last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things. Will He call you a brother and a sister? Will He say He's ashamed of you or proud of you? And through whom also He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He had provided purification for sins... He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He's pleading your case before God the Father while the Holy Spirit is pleading you and sealing you as adopted child and bringing many sons and daughters to glory. Do you realize that's the outcome of a follower of Jesus Christ? It was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation, the one who went there first, perfect through what he suffered. Boy, when I read that, I think, how much am I suffering? does not mean that I need to go out and find suffering. It just means that I need to not have other gods before him, and I need to be willing to go wherever he leads me. And that means I need to also be looking for those opportunities in those ways, not excusing them off. Both the one 
who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after me. Next week, we'll get into that part of what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. Because the disciples didn't understand this, so they immediately went into this, hey, how can we be great in the kingdom of God? And Jesus tells them again, if you want to be great in the kingdom, what? Be the least here. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your word. Lord, help us not to fix our eyes on things that are physical, things that are here, things that do wage and fight for our affection, Lord. But to realize that all blessings, including the breath of life, is a gift from you each and every day, that you are so gracious, compassionate, kind, enough that you would send your only Son to die for our sins so that we might live for your kingdom and glorify you and that we have the power and the authority to do that and together our lights will shine even brighter. Lord, help us to not miss the opportunities each day but realize that the breath of life that you've given us each day is that gift of life that we can share with others, that we can be kind and compassionate, giving, Lord, any of the things that you call us to do, help us to look for opportunities and to live like children of the Most High, denying ourselves, taking up whatever cross that is, because we know that th we are dead to the things of this world, but we live for Jesus. I pray that prayer for each and every one here and those that are apart from the body today, Lord, but are with us in spirit. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for this gift of salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. May we live our lives out in holy fear as children of the Most High. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.